Hello and welcome to The Bazooka. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at 10 OSCE stations in one clinical course. Today we're going to be looking at internal medicine, season one, episode five. We shall continue the cycle. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos when I post. Any images that you may see in this video um, that may bear some resemblance to some people may just be coincidental and they're only useful teaching purposes. So please grab your paper, grab your pen and let's go. So I shall give you again one minute intervals for you to be able to pause the video so that you could actually think of the questions and answer them before I give you the response. So station one, you are asked to do an abdominal examination on a patient with ascites. List the findings you would elicit during your examination, five marks. Give the different, five differentials for ascites, five marks. So you can pause the video right now. And if you still haven't yet gotten a piece of paper, this is your time to get your piece of paper and your pen to be writing this down. Okay, let's go to the answer right now. So remember that ascites is a condition where you have this fluid that is accumulating inside uh, the abdominal cavity. So it means that when you are examining this uh, patient, you're going to uh, be following uh, some schematic that we usually follow when we're examining. So in medicine, we're going to follow a procedure of inspection, a palpation, percussion, and then auscultation. So when you inspect, what are you suspecting to find? Or what are you expecting to find? So there's going to be a rounded abdomen. Obviously, this is going to be symmetrically distended. There will be some flank fullness. And of course, the umbilicus will be protruding and it will be displaced. You may sometimes see dilated superficial abdominal veins. You may sometimes see some abdominal stretch marks or abdominal striae. Now, in the early cases of ascites, you may uh, get this doughy feeling when you palpate that has almost this fluctuant sensation, kind of like a balloon that's filled with water. And then in the advanced uh, stages, you may see um, the abdomen being tense, or you may feel the abdomen being tense. When you percuss, there may be some periambilical uh, tympani with downness in the flanks when the patient is supine, and you may also see some fluid thrill, you may see shifting downness. So all these are features that are suggestive of uh, ascites inside um, uh, or on an abdominal examination. So give five differentials for ascites. So you could divide them into two groups, the ones where there's a normal peritoneum, meaning that the peritoneum isn't diseased, and the second group where the peritoneum is diseased. So you could have things like congestive heart failure, but Chiari syndrome, liver cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, a protein losing enteropathy, tricuspid regurgitation. And in, in these cases, it's either there's an increase in hydrostatic pressure or a decrease in the osmotic or oncotic pressure, rather. Then when the Peritoneum is diseased, you could have things like a peritoneal carcinomatosis where there is spread of um, cancerous cells or spread of a cancer to the peritoneum. You could have primary mesotheliomas of the uh, peritoneal membrane. You could have hepatocellular carcinomas. You could have uh, TB peritonitis or other infections. It could even be bacterial peritonitis. Station two, a female 32-year-old uh, presents with abdominal pain, weakness, palpitations for two weeks. On investigation, she has an HB of 8, and the organism in the picture was noted on results. So, part one, what organism is shown in the picture? Uh, part two, give the two main species that cause disease in humans. Part three, give a brief life cycle. Uh, part four, what are the risk factors? So, I shall give you a two second interval. Okay, so the organism that is shown in this picture is a hookworm. As you can see here is like the mouth part of this hookworm over there. You have the mouth part over here. So this is a hookworm. Uh, 
or you could refer to it as a helminth. So the two main species that affect humans that are hookworms, you have Ankylostoma diodinale as well as Neicata americanis. So these are the two important species. Now in the life cycle of this uh, organism, you have these larvae, which are known as filariform larvae that are usually found in moist, so moist soil. So whenever you're walking around barefoot or without any shoes on, then it can actually infect, uh, it can penetrate through the skin. And once it penetrates through the skin of someone who's walking barefoot in moist soil, then these uh, filariform larvae are pretty much going to be migrating to the alveoli, then they're going to crawl up the bronchi, then they're going to reach the trachea, and eventually they'll reach the throat where they're going to be swallowed. So when they are swallowed, the larvae are going to uh, pass through the GIT and eventually are going to develop into adult worms in the small intestine. And then eventually they are going to attach to um, the intestines themselves. So if it's with Neicata americanas, they use these cutting plates to attach, but with Ankylostoma diodinale, they use these teeth to hook on to the intestines. So they're going to hook on to these intestines and they're going to be feeding on the blood capillaries of these intestines, which explains why this person has a low HP because it's like they're having a chronic blood loss. So then these adults are going to be laying eggs. So they could be like about a thousand eggs that are passed in feces each and every single day. And then the eggs are eventually going to develop into an uninfectious feeding form, which is known as the rabidiform larvae, which are eventually going to penetrate the skin whenever the stool is passed out in moist soil and someone walks barefoot. So what are the risk factors? So walking barefoot on soil is a very big factor, especially the soil that contains these larvae. Uh, poor personal hygiene, if someone or if people go pooping around in the soil, that's a big risk factor. Or if sanitation is also not really taken care of, then that's a really, really big factor. So take some time to actually ingest this and you should know this. Question, or station three, describe the lesion in the image. What is the diagnosis? How is the condition classified? What diagnostic investigations would you request for? And what would be the findings? Mention one differential diagnosis. So you can pause the video right now. Okay, so the answer here is that, as you can see, these are like uh, purple colored, or you could call them violaceous patches because they are greater than uh, 0 0.5 centimeters. Um, you refer to them as macules if they're less than 0 0.5 uh, centimeters in diameter. So I think we could call these patches, purple patches. So what is the diagnosis? So this is most likely Kaposi sarcoma. Okay, yes. How is this condition classified? So there are four types. You could have a classical type or a sporadic type. This is also known as, I think, a European type. Then you have an African cutaneous type, which is also referred to as the endemic type. You have an AIDS-associated type which is referred to as an epidemic type and you have an immunosuppressant type which is known as an iatrogenic type so those are the four uh, different types or four different uh, classes of this condition what diagnosis or what diagnostic investigation would you request for so I'd want to do a skin biopsy and on your skin biopsy you're going to be seeing three important things so you're going to be seeing prominent spindle cells you're going to be seeing prominent slit like vascular spaces and you're going to be seeing extravasated red blood cells then mention one differential diagnosis, so it could be bacillary angiomatosis, it could also be small vessel vasculitis. Station four, question one, what is shown in the picture? Question two, what nerve is affected? Question three, list all of the cranial nerves. So take your time and actually notice what is actually wrong with this image that is shown on station four. Ignore the monobrow that's depicted here but anyways um, so as we can see here on the right side of this person they have a drooping of this upper eyelid which we are going to be referring to as unilateral right-sided ptosis or you can call it as blepharotosis which is what is depicted here you can also see that some of the skin markings or the wrinkles are not really so prominent on this side so most likely this person has uh, involvement of the facial nerve so cranial nerve number seven and then list all the cranial nerves remember when you're writing cranial nerves you should write them as cn with a roman numeral not as numbers so cranial nerve number one is the olfactory which is of course a sensory for the nose cranial nerve number two is the optic which is of course sensory for the eyes cranial nerve number three is oculomotor which innervates um, extraocular muscles so it's a 
motor type of thing. Then uh, cranial nerve uh, four is the trochlea, which also innervates extraocular muscles. Cranial nerve number five is trigeminal. Remember, it's divided into three divisions, an ophthalmic division, a maxillary division, and a mandibular division, V1, V2, and V3 respectively. Then cranial nerve number six, which is the abducens, which innervates the lateral rectus, which is a, a, an extraocular muscle. Cranial nerve number seven, which is the facial, which you innervates the, um, what do you call this, muscles of facial expression. It also has a, some sensory innervation to the tongue, the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Then you have cranial nerve number eight, which is the vestibular cochlea, which is for balance, obviously, the vestibular apparatus and the cochlea for hearing. Then cranial nerve number uh, nine, which is the glossopharyngeal, which has to do with muscles um, in the mouth and muscles in the pharynx. Then cranial nerve number 10, which is the vagus, which innervates a lot of organs. Remember, vagus means wanderer, so it's a nerve that starts off in the brainstem, wanders all over the body. Then cranial nerve number 11 is a spinal accessory nerve, and then cranial nerve number 12 is a hypoglossal. So there's a mnemonic to actually know this. There is the, the clean mnemonic, which is what I'm going to give on, your, on my channel, the dirty mnemonic, I'm not going to give that on my channel. You could look that up and then learn it on your own and let your friends know. But uh, we shall keep everything on this channel clean. So here is the mnemonic. Um, o, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet and help. So O, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet and help. So that's the clean mnemonic. The dirty mnemonic, you can discuss it on your own. If you still haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe. Drop a comment in the uh, comment section below and uh, let's have fun. So station five, during a major ward round, your consultant asks you to examine a 50 year old male patient. The patient has diabetes and you are asked to do a focused examination from his knees below bearing in mind his diagnosis. Lists the things you would be looking for or focus on in this patient so take note that this is a diabetic patient they are 50 years old so think of that as you're writing down your points that you're going to be looking for when you're examining the lower um, limb okay so the answer here so you may have diabetic dermopathy so you may see the uh, some pigmented pretibial patches sometimes it could be some dim, uh, diabetic uh, shin spots sometimes you may have diabetic foot syndrome where you have some callus that may be hardenings uh, especially underneath the foot you may have dry skin which is known as xerosis the same thing as xerosis you may have ulcers you may have decreased sensory sensation sometimes you may have a decrease in proprioception usually proprioception is the first thing that tends to go in diabetic patient so when you're examining you may examine for proprioception it may be decreased a uh, sensation to temperature may also be decreased sensation to pain may also be decreased you may also get what is known as uh, necrobiosis like like hodicum so necrobiosis lipodica is pretty much a, a chronic granulomatous a dermatological disease where you're going to be having these um, well demarcated round erythematous um, papules or these growths that are going to be either single or they could be a group of them. Sometimes you may have some eruptive blisters that may be forming and associated with diabetes. You refer to that as uh, bullosis diabeticorum. So these are just some new words that I know that you've probably never heard of. So you should check them out and you should know them and expect to look for them in uh, some diabetic patients. So station six identify the organism shown in the picture name two species that cause disease in men give a brief life cycle of the organism list some of the complications associated in men so here is the picture this station pretty much never shots in any internal medicine exam so you could expect it to be asked in various different type of ways so you could pause the video right now so this shown here is plasmodium falciparum these are trophozoites that are parasitizing uh, red blood cells these are obviously red blood cells where these ring forms that you could see so the other two species you could either pick plasmodium malariae you could pick plasmodium vivax you could 
pick Plasmodium ovale. Then give a, give a brief uh, life cycle of the organism. Remember that when a, mo a female Anopheles mosquito bites you, what is it's going to inject in its saliva are sporozoids. Now these sporozoids, as they are injected into your bloodstream, are going to migrate to the liver. And inside the liver, they're going to invade the hepatocyte and they're going to form what are known as pre-erythrocytic schizons. Now these pre-erythrocytic schizons are going to contain smaller subunits in them which are known as merozoids. Now after some time, these um, schizons are going to rupture, or these, you could call them hepatic schizons, are going to rupture and eventually kill off the hepatocytes, releasing these merozoids. And these merozoids are going to be released into the bloodstream where they could in invade red blood cells. Some of the merozoids um, are eventually going to divide in the red blood cells, but some of the schizons actually that remain in the liver may remain dormant and not release these merozoids, and you refer to those as hypnozoids. These are responsible for malaria relapse. So the hypnozoids are seen in Plasmodium vivax, they're also seen in Plasmodium ovale. Then these merozoids that have been released in the bloodstream are going to parasitize the red blood cells. They're eventually going to form trophozoites, and then these trophozoites are eventually going to form uh, erythrocytic schizons which are going to contain merozoids and then these merozoids will rupture and kill off the red blood cell to infect other red blood cells. While as other trophozoites do not develop into, um, I mean other merozoites do not develop into trophozoites but rather are going to be developing into gametes, macrogametes and microgametes. And these ma macrogametes and microgametes do not further develop in the human because remember the human is not the definitive host for the malaria or the plasmodium uh, parasite. So the definitive host is the mosquito. So these gametes are going to be taken up the next time a mosquito bites you and in the midgut of this uh, mosquito the microgametes and macrogametes are going to fuse to form a zygote and then the zygote is going to uh, form an uh, uh, ookinet and then an oocyst then an oocyst is going to contain sporozoids and then these sporozoids can migrate to the salivary gland of the mosquito for the next meal or completing the cycle. List some complications associated in men so you could have cerebral malaria, which is of course uh, two or more uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures attributed to any no other cause but malaria or an unarousable state attributed to no other cause but malaria. You could have pulmonary edema and respiratory distress. You could have algid malaria, which is pretty much shock. You could have acute kidney injury. You could have black water fever, which is hemoglobinuria. You could have... Um, Severe anemia, which is an HP less than six. You could have spontaneous bleeding and coagulopathy, meaning uh, you could also have dis disseminated intravascular coagulation. You could have hypoglycemia, which is a blood sugar less than 2.2 uh, millimoles per liter. You could have metabolic acidosis, which is a pH less than 7.25 or bicarbonate concentration that's less than 15 millimoles per liter. You could have hyperparasitemia or hyperpyrexia, which is a temperature that's greater than 39. All these features are features of severe or complications of malaria. So station seven on the 25th of January, 2021, a male 65 years old presents with fever, cough, muscle aches, fatigue for four days, has hypertension and diabetes, not HIV positive. The chest x-ray is as shown, as we can see. Now, well, question one, comment on the x-ray. Uh, part two, list the four cardinal tests that you would order. Uh, part three, what are the possible differentials? Part four, what is uh, the likely diagnosis? Um, part five, name one physical feature that has been associated with poor outcome in such patients. So take your time and actually look at this x-ray. If you're still having trouble with looking at x-rays and interpreting x-rays, we shall have x-ray week very soon. So do not forget to tell a friend, to tell a friend that it shall be x-ray week very soon. So here is the answer. So as we can see from this x-ray, the thing that really stands out is that we could see that at the bottom of the lungs here, as well as here, you have these opacities that are, are not really completely opaque. So you can't really call them consolidations because you could obviously see through these. So you refer to this appearance as a ground glass appearance that's going to be affecting the lower zones of um, the lungs. It's also affecting the periphery to some extent. The cardiothoracic ratio is marginally normal and um, the, the trachea is central. And as we can see here, we could almost visualize the pleura over here. So the uh, absent lung markings from this point, this could be that there's a pneumothorax here or there is air that is trapped here. 
so the absent lung markings that are there. So this here is a typical x-ray that we see in patients that have a COVID-19 um, pneumonia. So it could be that this person has COVID-19 pneumonia or multifocal pneumonia or viral pneumonia or even TB that we should actually rule out. So when you're ordering the full cardinal investigations, you want to do a viral nucleic uh, RNA detection test or PCR that's going to be detecting for COVID. You want to look for D-dimers uh, because it may be associated with... Um, what do you call this coagulopathies in the blood and again if you still haven't yet watched the covid video i will leave a card at the end of this video so that you could watch the video then you could do a sputum for microscopy culture and sensitivity yeah as well as gen expert for tb to rule it out notice how i haven't started with the full blood count so please do not start ordering a full blood count because it will be non-specific in this case you may also want to do some blood cultures if you were actually asked to order for more investigations. So your differential diagnosis would be COVID-19 or multifocal pneumonia. You could also have TB, but it's most likely that this patient has COVID-19. So name one physical feature that has been associated with poor prognosis. So if you get an adult that's greater than 65 years, that's having dyspnea and desaturating, that's a poor prognostic. Uh, these are poor prognostic physical findings and of course you may sometimes get a rise in the d-dimers this is going to be a poor laboratory prognostic factor in covid patients so station eight which is was a similar station that we did in uh, season one episode one of these series so part one what deformity do you see on the right hand what deformity do you see on the left hand in which conditions are these signs seen? List two variants that uh, this diagnosis has. List five extra articular features of this condition. So I won't spend time on this because we talked about it in the first episode. So this here is a swan neck deformity that you see on the right side here. This is a boutonniere's deformity. And of course, this is rheumatoid arthritis. You have two main variants. You have what is known as a seropositive type and seronegative type. When you're talking of seropositive, you're just simply talking of whether rheumatoid factor is present or rheumatoid factor is absent. Then, of course, the extra articular manifestations could affect um, the CNS, it could affect the cardiovascular system, it could affect the respiratory system. So you could have interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, you could have pleuritis, you could have pleural effusions, obliterative bronchiolitis, pericardial effusions, atherosclerosis, rheumatoid vasculitis, myocarditis, valvular dysfunction, which could be a mitral regurgitation, anemia of chronic disease, as well as thrombocytopenia. So you could just pick any five and put them here. The reason why I've listed so many of them is you should know at least 10 extra articular manifestations of rheumatoid because sometimes they may ask you to talk about 506. So station 9, a 35 year old woman comes to your clinic complaining of um, impending feeling of anxiousness and palpitation. You perform a physical examination and your significant findings are a high temperature, tachycardia, high blood pressure. Above is a facial picture of the 35 year old woman as you can see here shown in the picture describe the abnormality seen on the picture what is the name of the lesion called what is your most likely diagnosis um list five other clinical features that may be present in this patient list diagnostic investigations you would order so take some time you have a two second interval Okay, so as we can see, this woman here has periorbital edema, so periorbital orbit swelling. And if your definition is actually pretty high in this video, you can actually see that she also has a moist, sweaty skin. And then you have this characteristic look, which is known as a wide-eyed stare gaze. You can see also that the upper eyelid here seems to be retracted. So you have retraction of the upper eyelid where we could visualize the sclera that is above the cornea. In a normal individual, you're not supposed to visualize this or you don't usually visualize this. So the, the condition that this woman has is most likely exophthalmos, which is associated with thyroid disease. So this woman has hypothyroidism, most likely due to Graves' disease. So we'll list five clinical uh, features that may be present. So this woman may have fine tremors. She may have ex excessive sweating or sweaty palms submenstrual irregularity, sometimes even infertility. There may be excessive weight loss despite her having an increased appetite. So you could think of it kind of like a car that's running and you keep pressing on the gas fuel without moving anywhere. So you're going to be using up the gas, but you're not going anywhere. You're 
uh, producing a lot of heat but not really moving anywhere then of course there are going to be loose stools so we don't want to refer to it as diarrhea anymore we refer to it as hyperdefecation you may sometimes have insomnia you have hair loss sometimes you may have pretibial myxedema so we'll list diagnostic investigations that you would order so you would order thyroid function tests t3 t4 and tsh so if you get a low tsh high t3 and high t4 it means that the problem is within the thyroid gland itself so you refer to that as a primary hyperthyroidism if you get high tsh high t3 and high t4 that's a secondary hyperthyroidism so look for other causes or outside the thyroid gland you may order some serum like tsh auto antibodies even some antithyroid peroxidase antibodies in the case of graves disease with the serum tsh like antibodies you may do a radio isotope radio isotope scan of the thyroid sometimes there may be some thyrotoxic lesions that may be there in the thyroid you may order uh, an ultrasound of the thyroid to ensure if it's a cyst or a solid enlargement of the thyroid gland so this woman may have a goiter you may also want to do a fine needle aspiration and cytology to check if it's a benign or malignant growth in case of this woman having a goiter so the last and the final station, if you haven't done ECG, this is going to be hell for you. So what findings are on this ECG? List the normal parameters of the P wave, PR interval and QRS complex. List indications for these tests. So take your time. You could pause the video at this moment. If your quality is still low, you could increase your quality to HD so that you could actually see this ECG very well. We do not want any excuses that you haven't seen the ECG or you can't see it very clearly. So here comes the answer. As we can see from this ECG, we have, first of all, if we measure the RR interval from here to here, here to here, here to here, let's use this strip here. From here to here, take a paper, mark this distance from here to here, then move your paper along this. You'll find out that all these waves coincide with each other. So it's most likely that um, your rhythm is regular. As we can see, we can make out a P wave here, a QRS complex here, a T wave. A P wave here, a QRS complex here, a T wave. A P wave here, a QRS complex, a T wave. So we can make that out. So your rhythm is most likely regular, especially if we are following from lead two, because that's where we could see that most of the P waves are more prominent. But Look at what's happening here at lead AVF. As we can see, we don't actually have some difficulty in discerning any uh, recognizable waves that we could see here. So probably maybe the atria may have failed to actually contract or there may have been some um, multiple atrial impulses that uh, came in this case that weren't really conducted to the ventricle. As we can see, we can barely discern a QRS complex in lead AVF here. But when we look at the rate of this ECG, the rate is normal, so they are about 16 squares. So if we could use this interval here, so you have like about 5, 10, 15, about 16 squares. So if you divide 1,500 by 16, you get a, a rough estimate of about 94 beats per minute so that's what we usually find out about axis deviation the, i would say this is a normal cardiac axis because if we compare lead one uh, lead three lead avf and lead two as we can see lead one and lead three are facing in opposite direction so that would tempt you to say that it's a left axis deviation but if you remember from your ecg videos left axis deviation only becomes significant if lead two is also facing downwards that's when it becomes really significant for you to have left axis deviation everything else our rs wave progression seems quite all right in the ccg so list normal parameters of the p wave pr interval and qrs complex so the p wave the amplitude should be less than three millivolts uh in lead two and uh, it should be negative in lead avr and of course less than one millivolt uh, terminal negative deflection in lead v1 the PR interval should be three to um, five small squares. So that's about 0 0.12 to about 0 0.20. If you don't want to use seconds, you could say 120 to about 200 milliseconds. Then the QRS complex is less than 0 0.12 seconds. So it's between one to three small boxes. Then list indications. So you could use an ECG to make a diagnosis of an old or even a new myocardial infarction. You could identify some conduction abnormalities. Some arrhythmias could be picked up from the ECG. You could determine any change hypertrophy you could determine ischemic heart disease which is falls under the same bracket of myocardial infarction you could determine pericarditis myocarditis electrolyte imbalances even in individuals that have a pacemaker where the pacemaker tends to malfunction here's a bonus station for you all i shall leave this 
on your screen and please comment below what you what you think this condition is all about what symptoms the patient is going to present with what risk factors and what complications leave the comments below in the comment section and let me know i shall announce the answer in the next video on the bazooka so thank you for taking your time to listen to episode 5 stay tuned for episode 6 please stay safe Subscribe.